answer. Well, this was me. I wanted to know how in the world Christmas in July came to be a thing. Because I, start, I started like counting the months. I'm like, because if you don't think about it, maybe you're like me, your first thought is, well, that's probably the halfway point on the opposite end of Christmas, right? We can begin the countdown that, hey, we're, we're getting closer. But no, that's five months to Christmas. And I'm like, that, that doesn't make sense. There has to be something more. And so to Google, I went. And it turns out we can thank a summer camp in North Carolina in 1933 for Christmas in July. Now, perhaps the summer camp didn't know their greatest impact would be that, that there is a national saying among generations of Christmas in July. But nevertheless, we have the saying Christmas in July. Um, well, just to let you all know, Holy Week begins this week. Not really, but we're going to have kind of Easter in September, slash October, slash November. I don't, I don't really know in the reading plan where we get to the end of this, but it's going to feel like we're having Easter in the fall of the year rather than the spring because uh, today we're going to begin just after Jesus' triumph, triumphant entr entry. My goodness, I went to New Room and came back and can't talk anymore. But anyway, we begin just after Palm Sunday and Jesus riding into Jerusalem. Uh, and I'm actually thankful for this opportunity to have Easter in the fall because it actually gives us a chance to look at scriptures that more naturally get kind of passed over when it's truly Holy Week. Because you know, I was like, okay, well, if it's Palm Sunday, how am I going to skip the Palm Sunday scripture and go to what Jesus did on Monday? So that doesn't really work, but today it's going to. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 21. Verses 12 through 17, and I will read from the English Standard Version. It says, As Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. God, we pray that uh, as we walk through this scripture, Father, that your Holy Spirit would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to understand your message for your people this morning, that Jesus would be glorified. And it's in his holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Now, I know I just talked about you'd never skip over the Palm Sunday scripture on Palm Sunday to talk about what happened Monday and that this, to, you know, today gives us an opportunity to do that. But we do have to back up just a little bit because we have to get some context to understand uh, at least a better picture of the significance of what Jesus does in verses 12 through 17. I want to ask you a question. How many red cars were there on your drive into church this morning? Think about it just a second. Red cars. How many did you see? How many were there? Somebody said, what did you say, zero? Did anybody even notice one red car on the way in? All right, so we got, all right, so was it only one the whole drive? Not that you noticed that there was. Can anybody confidently give me the exact number? And y'all are probably like, okay, can you get to where you're going with this? The point being, you don't know and you can't confidently say, one, because you didn't know to be looking for any red cars. You didn't know this was going to be a pop quiz, much less that the question on the pop quiz would have nothing to do with Scripture and be about the color of cars that were on your route this morning. Now, I'm be honest with you. I wanted to be able to give the answer of red cars on the ride into church this morning, and I forgot to look. 
I forgot to count. I knew, I knew the pop quiz was coming. It wasn't a pop quiz to me, and I just forgot. So I can't tell you how many there were. My answer would have to be zero that I saw, but that doesn't mean there weren't any. And here, here's the point. It, it's no shock that the people, the vast majority of the people of Israel missed Jesus as the Messiah. And certainly, even though they praised him on Palm Sunday, Hosanna to the son of David, on Thursday they're yelling, crucify him. So there is an, what we call an extra-biblical work, and it's called the Psalms of Solomon. Not the Songs of Solomon, that, that's in our canon, but the Psalms of Solomon. So it's not in the canon of Scripture. It wasn't even written by Solomon. Whoever did just kind of stuck his name to it. I guess they thought if we put his name to it, surely they'll keep up with this document. But one of the Psalms, the 17th Psalm of Solomon is uh, written about the coming of the Messiah. And, and they, you can read uh, once they shift from praise to God, hey, you know, we're Israel, it's us again, we've sinned. And then it shifts into, but send the son of David. And it starts praying to God for the Messiah and describing who they believe the Messiah to be. And now we, we've all heard, you know, they, they really expected the Messiah to come in on a white horse and, and run the Romans out of town. But I'm going to tell you, that summary doesn't really do justice to exactly what they were looking for. If you go and you do a dive on that 17th Psalm, you'll see that they were looking for someone who would have been man. That somehow, even though he was only a man, would be without sin. That, that, that God was going to be his teacher. And then it get, starts getting into things like purge Jerusalem from Gentiles. I mean, they, they thought that he was going to send everyone except the Jewish people away, not just the Romans, but anybody. This was going to be a purification, a restoration of Israel, that Jerusalem's going to be back on that pedestal. And it talks about all nations will be under his feet. I mean, this is the coming of the kingdom of God forever. And in their mind, it looked like everybody else is out and we're in. And then it closes with, blessed are those who will live in these days in Israel. Now, we have to get into a little bit of history. And if you were the type of person that sat in an English class and then the teacher read and say, okay, what do you think the author meant by that? You're probably going to hate this next little bit, but just stick with me, I promise. We're going somewhere. So Jesus rides in on Palm Sunday, and he goes to the temple, and he essentially looks around and says, it's, it's late, I'm going to deal with this tomorrow. And while during Holy Week, he's traveling back and forth from Bethany and Bethphage and staying there. And so he comes back on Monday, which we find in Mark, and then he goes to the temple and he begins the work of cleansing it, which we just read about in Matthew 12. That is the second temple. So the history of Israel, we have what's called temple eras. The first one was from 1200 B.C. to 583 B.C. And in 583, King Nebuchadnezzar, he conquers Jerusalem, he destroys the temple that was constructed by Solomon, and then we enter this period where the Israelites are exiled to Babylon. Well, the second temple period, and I'll be honest with you, I couldn't find why the dates overlap a little bit, but anyway, in 586 B.C. to 70 A.D., well, in 583, the Jews return from exile, and in 515 B.C., remember we count down to go forward now, the reconstruction of the second temple is complete. Now to find where we're going with this, if we go to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1. So this is going back to the first temple that's been built by Solomon, and we're going to have the dedication of the temple. It says, when Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good. His love endures forever. And then they go on to offer sacrifices before the Lord. So we have the first temple that David, has, you know, he, he has this grand idea. He's like, I'm going to build God a house. And God's like, you want to build me a house? You know, because it, 
before then, it's just been kind of a mobile, like we can pick up and move where we want to. And not that God didn't have great detail in the tabernacle, but David's like, no, I live in this palace. I'm building God a house. And God said, well, hang on a minute. You're not going to because you've really been a man of war, but your son is going to build it, and then I'll dwell there. And so Solomon builds the temple, and we have this dedication as affirmed by this sign from God where his glory and his presence so fills the temple that everybody else has got to just stand outside. It says, when they, so the Lord has filled the temple, he's above the temple, and it says, in response, they hit their face on the pavement, and they praise and worship him and say that he is good, his love endures forever. But then again, that temple doesn't last forever, because Israel does what we always do you know we we sin but then in the second temple again that construction completed in 515 bc we don't get anything like we just read in second chronicles chapter 7 we don't see the spirit of god filling the temple we don't see these signs and wonders and fire and smoke and glory and shock and all we don't get that and so there is an argument, uh, N.T. Wright is, is one who uh, argues this extensively, that when you track through the Old Testament in the Second Temple era, that there's this motif, this um, plot, if you will, of the people of God waiting on the Lord to come and fill the temple, to come and return to Zion. And there you can look in Jeremiah, uh, Zechariah, Malachi, Habakkuk. There are several instances, even Isaiah, like chapter 40 through 51, or there's a big chunk in the middle where it talks about the Lord coming with power to Zion. And so hence we get they're looking for the Messiah when Jesus comes because they're anticipating the return of the Lord. Because, hey, we've got the temple, but we've not had this whole filling like we had the first time. And, man, we really have not had a long stretch of freedom at all. Uh, we came back. We rebuilt some things. But just to show you how they break down the second temple era, it's by who was oppressing the Israelites at any given time. So you've got the Persian era, the Hellenistic era, where the Greeks came through. And then you've got the Roman era. I mean, they, they, they enjoyed like four years right there uh, in about 160 B.C. where they were free and an independent nation. That's how much freedom they had without somebody coming in, taking them over, and oppressing them. And so they're waiting on this return. Some of them, particularly in Zechariah, there are moments where you think, yep, that fits Jesus' first coming to a T. And then you move, like, for instance, in chapter 12, and you think, well, that, that really sounds like the second coming. And then you can look at some of Paul's writings, and it's, you know, sometimes it's, well, yeah, that would have been fulfilled with the first coming, but that really sounds like the second coming. And so there are some people who argue back and forth, but what I, having not had as many degrees or as many decades studying as some of these theologians have, I would argue it, it, it very well could be both and. For example, in the Old Testament, prophecies were known to have a short-term and a long-term fulfillment. And many of them, when it talked about the long term, pointed to Jesus. And that's why you see in the Old Test or in the New Testament, the writers point back to verses in the Old Testament and they start stringing them together and saying it was right in front of our face the whole time, but we really didn't see it. But now that God has revealed himself in Jesus, we can look back and it's plain as day. You know, we are blessed that we live post-revelation. That we know what we're waiting on. We, we've got the canon of Scripture. We can read the whole thing and we can see the thread. I'm going to tell you, the Bible makes a whole lot more sense when you realize that it is one story about the way God created everything to be, the way it was when man messed it up, and then the rest is God's plan to get back to where he intended it to be in the first place with a new heaven and a new earth in perfect holy communion with the creation he loves, with those who will be called sons and daughters of God. So then, N.T. Wright argues that Jesus coming down from the Mount of Olives on the donkey and then immediately going to the temple is that return of Yahweh to Israel, to the temple. It is him coming in... It, this time with an agent, which we see in the Old Testament that God does come with an agent. That's why they're looking for the Messiah. But what was missed was that it was God himself coming in the form of man as a return to Israel. Now, why is any of this relevant? Why the history lesson? 
when Jesus came, and, and granted, I don't believe that was his sole purpose. Do I think it's something that he fulfilled? Yes. Do, do I think we have to completely settle on which, you know, which group of theologians we're going to believe? To it, It's not a salvific issue. But when Jesus came to the temple, first was his presence. Then he, he looks around and he says, well, it's, it's getting late. I'm going to go back. But when it comes the second day, the second day began the cleanup where he enters the temple and he drives out those who sold and bought in the temple. He's flipping over tables in righteous anger of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. Because what happened was these religious leaders that were to be offering the sacrifices, which would atone for the people, they were giving their buddies a kickback by, because when the people brought their offering, they look at it and say, mm, man, that one's blemished. I can't give you my stamp of approval. But I tell you what, if you'll go right over here into these courts, um, a buddy of mine, I mean, uh, there's a guy who's selling some pigeons that we, I, we're, they're pre-certified. They, they come with a band around their I, I'm exaggerating now. I don't really know that. But, hey, they're approved. If you'll go buy one of those and then come back, we'll, we'll make the sacrifice, we'll atone for your sin, and you'll be good to go. And so that's why Jesus says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And so Jesus comes, and then Jesus begins to clean up. Now, in the New Testament, Scripture tells us that we are temples. That we are temples of the Holy Spirit. And we believe that when you profess faith in Christ, that Holy Spirit comes to be in us. God in us. God the Father, now separated from us on this side of Eden, is in heaven. Spirit on the throne. Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. And then Holy Spirit, God in us as temples of God's presence. God comes to us in salvation. But that is not the end. It is only a new beginning. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. Then begins the process of sanctification. Then begins the cleanup process. Where Jesus says, hey, I love you just the way you are, but I love you enough not to leave you the way that I found you. Now, we've talked uh, the last couple of weeks about how salvation is the work of God. And our job is to submit and receive it. I have good news. Sanctification, as Paul says, see to it that your sanctification is taking place. Sanctification is also the work of God's grace. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to do the cleanup in this temple, just as Jesus did in this temple. Jesus comes, and he says, okay, this is my house. This is not going to be a house of robbers. This is going to be a house of prayer. And he begins his work of cleanup so long as we submit to his grace, his power, and his authority. Now, there's one thing that sticks out to me here. When Jesus comes into the temple, his anger was toured and taken out on those who were intentionally harming and robbing and stealing from the people of God. When Jesus came into my life and that sanctification process began, not once did Jesus ridicule me. Not once did Jesus just beat on me and say, you should have known better. What is this doing here? His, his anger was not pointed at me, but his love was. But I know who his anger was pointed toward, the one who was responsible for any sin in the first place. Because, again, we're not living in God's original intent and design, though we're headed back that way. God pointed his anger from the very beginning toward the one who caused the sin in the first place, the enemy. He looks at the serpent in the garden and hands out the harshest punishment to him. And he says, he will crush your head while you strike his heel. God's worst wrath has always been towards the enemy. And then when Jesus Christ comes and he did the work on our behalf where he gave his perfect, sinless life up for us, for our ransom and on our behalf, his body was broken and his blood shed, the wrath was towards the enemy. 
It was to break the power. It was to take back dominion from the evil one. It was to break the power of the one who seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. And then on the flip side, in verse 14, it says, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And then we get out of the mouth of babes, Hosanna to the son of David. Now we know that the chief priest didn't like it because well, they're calling this guy the Messiah and he is nothing like what, what we thought. You know, we, we're, we're ready for war and he comes in riding on a donkey as a, sign, as a time, sign of the times of peace. But to those who are poor in spirit, Jesus does bring peace. He comes in and his, yes, not to leave you the way he found you, to begin that cleanup process of sanctification in his work and his grace and mercy, but not out of wrath directed at us, out of love for us, and to heal us. Jesus doesn't want us to have a list of do's and don'ts. That, that is not the purpose. Might that be a result? Sure. But what Jesus wants is for us to be healed and for us to be holy because God, from the beginning, has been making steps to where we end up back in perfect communion with Him. And so this process of sanctification is to remove those things in us that separate us from the Father, that grieve the Holy Spirit. And so in His grace, not only did He do the work to save us from our sin in the first place, but then He continues the work into sanctification where He can draw us deeper and more intimately into a communitive relationship with Him because He loves us. We love because Christ first loved us. And I'll close with this as the praise team comes back. We were reminded of something at New Room in the closing talk. And the speaker, whose name I don't remember off the top of my head, though it's on my phone somewhere on the app that had the agenda on it. And he goes to the Gospel of Matthew where the father brings his child and he says, you know, I believe, help my unbelief. And the disciples are like, well, why couldn't we cast down? He said, unbelief. And, and, and Jesus, and I'm very much paraphrasing, he says, if you can get rid of this unbelief, then nothing will be impossible for you. And, and the point he made was that we hold back because we know the responsibility and the stipulations that come with that. I think the same is true in this instance. I think we hold back not just from salvation, but especially from sanctification because we know that there are things that come with that, that there are expectations Works not to earn your salvation, but as a result of salvation. But I'm going to tell you, Jesus is not just looking for employees. He is looking to pour out his love to you, to heal you, to make you whole, and to bring you peace as he draws you into communion with him. Yes, through salvation. Continued through sanctification. We've been talking several weeks about win the lost. And now we're shifting to disciple the found. Because it's two sides of the same coin of God's grace and love towards his people. Holy Spirit, we pray. Lord, we know you are in this room. You are moving and working and drawing hearts to you. Father, may we open our hands. May we let go of the things that we're clinging to that would hold us back for whatever reason. Father, may we receive your grace, your love, and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.